Good morning. My name is Katie Domrat, and I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the VMFA. Um, today, we have a really great talk with Madeline Dugan, um, the VMFA Curatorial Assistant, and um, she's going to be speaking about some pieces in our Decorative Arts Collection for this month's 3 and 30. With that, I am going to pass it off to Madeline. Thank you, Katie. I'm just going to share my screen. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, Today, I will be talking specifically about French Art Nouveau and the inspiration it took from Japanese art and culture. So happy Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We have three decorative works of art that we will look at today that will provide a good example of Art Nouveau's heavy reliance on Japanese aesthetics. We'll spend a little time with each of them and then we will have time for questions at the end. As Katie mentioned, my name is Madeline Dugan. I am the curatorial assistant to Dr. Michael Taylor, our chief curator and deputy director for art and education for the state. Art Nouveau is really my bread and butter. So I'm currently co-curating an exhibition of Art Nouveau posters for the works on paper gallery for this July with Barry Schiffman, our curator of decorative arts, as well as an exhibition of Japanese woodblock prints by Kawase Hasui with Li Jin, our curator of East Asian art for this coming January. So I was thrilled when I was asked to do this three and 30 because it's really combining my two loves. And I do just wanna give a shout out to my wonderful colleagues, Barry Schiffman and Li Jin who have both generously allowed for me to have these opportunities and they've taught me so much. They are both wonderful curators and I strongly encourage everyone to check out their respective galleries when you come to the museum. I also recommend you all go check out Li Jin's beautiful installation of Japanese woodblock prints in the Works on Paper Gallery. Eight Views of Omi, Japanese woodblock prints by Ito Shinsui will be up until July 9th, so you still have time to see it before it closes. So let's start with a little bit of background. Japanism is a French expression that describes the late 19th century Western fascination with Japanese art and design. This craze for Japanese art developed out of the forcible opening of Japan's borders in 1853, which had been closed to the West since around 1640. The opening of Japan's borders meant rapid dissemination of fine art and craft into the Western art market, which inspired artists like Van Gogh, Manet, and Klimt. And it really impacted the decorative art specifically. The Paris-based art dealer Siegfried Bing was a prominent collector of Japanese art, and he opened an East Asian art boutique in Paris in 1875. And he published a magazine of Japanese art called Le Japon Artistique, which promoted Japanese art and decorative prints. This was published in French, German, and English, and so it had a great impact across Western countries and their respective artists. Bing was also the owner of Le Art Nouveau, which was a salon he opened in 1895 that sold luxurious decorative arts made by in-house artists like Charpentier, Orazi, and other designers whose work we do have in our galleries. The salon's name is consequently what gave Art Nouveau the movement its name, and this movement is characterized by its curvilinear style and overall maximalist approach to decorative arts. This movement is typically dated from around 1890 to 1914, which coincides with the time period where Japanism was at its height. So you would be hard pressed to walk through our Art Nouveau galleries and find something that wasn't touched by Japanese influence. So we'll start with an earlier work that sort of predates the Art Nouveau period in 1876, which is Felix Brockman's tableware set, a few pieces of which we have currently on view. Brockman was a painter, etcher, and printmaker, though he is best known for his etchings. He was close friends with Edward Manet, James Neil Whistler, um, who were both prolific collectors of Japanese art and inco incorporated those aesthetics into their work. So it's no shock that Brockman also incorporated this aesthetic into his work as well. Brockman was also one of the nine members of the Society du Jing Lar, 
which was a Japanese dinner club in the town of Sevres, France, that held monthly meetings to discuss Japanese art. So he was well acquainted with this East Asian style. In 1860, the ceramics merchant, glassmaker, and Japanese art lover Francois Eugene Rousseau commissioned Brockmon to design the surface decoration for a tableware service that would be exhibited at the 1867 World Exhibition in Paris, and that is the service that you see. While these are very traditional European forms when it comes to tableware, the surface decoration is taken directly from Japanese manga, manga being the Japanese word for sketches. And these designs were taken from Karashika Hokusai's mangas, which were released in a 15 volume series between 1819 to 1878. And actually Gustav Klimt had a couple of these as well. Brackmon had found this series in the workshop of his printer, Auguste de Latre, and he loved them so much that he literally just copied them onto these pieces. So they're not exact one-to-ones, but you can see that he is taking artistic liberties to copy the Japanese motifs that he liked the most in these mangas. This is um, an image of two different pieces that are not currently on view, but I, it's a much more literal take on um, these mangas. So as you can see, they're not exact one-to-ones. The hands are a little bit differently positioned, but you can tell that he is looking directly at these sketches. So because this service is the first example of a European artist taking direct inspiration from a Japanese artist, this series is actually the first artwork to be cited as an example of Japanism in France which is why I thought it was important to start with. But now let's skip about 20 years into the future to the 1890s when we're firmly settled in Art Nouveau era with a piece that shows a little bit more subtle influence from Japan. This funnel service was designed by Leon Kong who had studied as a sculptor which is reflected in the reliefs and forms in and on his works. And this service was manufactured by the French porcelain company, Sevres. As I already mentioned while talking about Brockmon, the Society du Ginglar was located in Sevres. So while working at the Sevres factory, it's likely that Khan would have at least heard about or have been influenced by these other artists' discussions of Japanese art. The Sevres factory likewise was pushing for new ideas. And at this point, they were really leaning into East Asian influences, which you can see in this piece that is also manufactured by Sevres a few years later with the same naturalistic color palette. This piece is in the same gallery as the coffee service, just a few cases down. You can see the same aesthetic treatment in these pieces as the coffee service with their naturalistic color palette and foliage wrapping around them. And again, there's a Japanese influence with what looks like a reference to the common motif of plum blossoms. Sevs is a large company mass producing works and trying to appeal to the current fashions at the time. So they're leaning heavily into the Japanese art aesthetic because it's what's in vogue at that time. So in this service, Khan is taking Japanese reverence for nature and turning it into a literal representation of the fennel plant and bugs, which he makes beautiful here, even if normally you probably wouldn't want a beetle on your tea service. The dragonflies in the corner of the plate are also a common motif in both decorative arts as well as paintings from Japan. Now, I think most of us envision a coffee pot as something like this Philip Wolfer's pot from his Orchid Coffee and Tea Service, which is also on view in the Art Nouveau galleries. You probably wouldn't think to brew such a small amount of coffee and use such a tiny little coffee pot as the Sev's pot. 
this service isn't really practical for the European audience it was made for, and that's because Khan is looking to East Asian tea forms, which are vastly different from what we are familiar with here in the West. In East Asia, tea is served with a tiny teapot, and teapots differ in shapes and sizes depending on what type of tea you're actually brewing, because the shape of the pot will enhance the flavor depending on what leaves you're using. The cups you use in East Asian cultures are tiny because you're not letting it sit for a long time while you chat like you would with an English tea. And if you've ever been to a Japanese restaurant, think of like a sake cup. It's similar in that you have a large vessel holding and storing hot liquid, which is poured into a small cup that's meant to be sipped then and there. Typically, Japanese teacups are small because they let you sit and drink it slowly, and it's better for taking time to taste and appreciate the flavor of the tea. I think most of you will probably be familiar with at least the concept of the Japanese tea ceremony, which is an important aspect of Japanese life, especially during this period. So what you see here in this coffee service is an appreciation for Japanese aesthetics and craftsmanship, while at the same time, there's this Western idealization of the foreign culture from which French designers are appropriating. It's a lack of complete understanding of the Japanese culture and a romanticization of visual culture that culminates here in this quite beautiful yet slightly impractical coffee service. And I say impractical because if you look at the physical forms of these coffee pots um, and this milk cup, um, you see the spouts are on the same level as the lids, which makes for a very dysfunctional pouring vessel because the liquid would come out both the top and the spout at the same time and make a mess. So the service acts as more of a sculptural decorative piece than a functioning coffee set, which allowed Khan here to take these aesthetic liberties and really lean into Japanese tea forms. So the final piece that I'm going to talk about is the fire screen that we have by Paul Ranson. Ranson was a painter and a writer, and he was one of the five founders of Le Navi, which was a post-impressionist symbolist art group. Le Navi translates from Hebrew to mean the prophets, and they thought of themselves as high priests that could see the conceptual truths of art that normal people couldn't. So as you can see, they thought very highly of themselves. And Ranson designed the central image on this screen and gave it to his close friend, Laura Lacombe, who then embroidered the design onto silk. Not a lot is known about Lacombe, though we do know she was the mother of French painter, George Lacombe, and she herself was also a painter of oils and watercolor. And she also worked as a commercial artist and illustrator that made numerous etchings. Here's the embroidered screen in comparison to Ranson's original tempera painting that he designed, which gives a more detailed example of his original vision before it was translated to silk. I think the border in the tempera painting is really interesting here. It's not included in the eventual fire screen, but I think it gives a better glimpse into the influence of Asian screens, which you can see in the border of this Japanese screen and VMFA's collection, Landscaping Cranes by Kano Tanya. So you can see the border, decorative border around here. And I think you can see through this comparison how Ranson and Lacombe's screen draws heavily on Japanese screen and woodblock aesthetics with its minimalistic background and flat picture plane, as well as with its monochromatic color palette. The imagery is very Asian inspired while still drawing on European forms for the physical construction of the screen itself. The subject matter of this screen also pulls from Japanese ukiyo-e prints. Ukiyo-e translates to pictures of the floating world. They're a genre of woodblock prints with themes that revolve mostly around urban everyday life in the pleasure quarters of Japan, with subjects like courtesans, actors, and prostitutes. 
Though Yukioe produced a lot of figurative works by the end of the 19th century, its subject matter moved back more towards landscapes. These prints were mass produced and easily transported to Europe where collectors like the previously mentioned Siegfried Bing would disseminate them and artists could see their varying subject matter. Imagery of women in the process of bathing was common in Yukioi prints and you can see that reflected here in this screen of the nude women doing their hair and this print here. I thought this was a fun comparison too. Here you see two women after their baths drying off with a cat playing with one of the women's robes. And there's also a cat in Renson screen. Also similarly to the woodblock print behind the women in Renson screen, it looks like there's this diagonal line here um, and floral motifs and this swan that sort of implies that there's a screen behind these women as well, just like in the woodblock print. And then there's this illusion to steam in this abstract depiction of water. This imagery in Yukioi prints was so prominent that we also see it inspiring other Western artists like Marie Cassatt here. So as you can see, I think it's reasonable to conclude that Ranson was heavily influenced by Japanese woodblock prints when he was designing the surface decoration of this screen. So what I hope I have illustrated through discussing these works is how European artists were looking at Japanese art and artists and reinterpreting motifs, styles, and the Japanese culture as a whole into their own work. And with that, I will turn it back over to Katie. Thank you so much, Madeline. This was really interesting. And these are really some great objects that you chose this month. Great, thank you for listening. All right, bye.